Welcome to episode 47 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Myla de Butterworth, and today we learn how Grendel's mother comes back for revenge and how Beowulf reacts in part two of Conflict with Demons. Now, demon vengeance was brooding against the warriors because that Grendel was slain, his mother. A female demon was filled with woe in her dwelling amidst awesome waters and cold streams. Ravenous and wrathful, she resolved to go forth to avenge her son's death. In the darkness, she made her sorrowful way and came to Heorot, where the warriors slept on the benches. When she broke in, there was again terror in the hall, which was just as much less than before as a woman's strength into a man's on the battlefield. Swords were drawn hastily. There was no time to don armor. The she-demon, perceiving that she was discovered, made haste to depart, but she had seized in her grim claws a sleeping noble, and she carried him off towards the fen. He was Hrothgar's comrade's warrior and shield-bearer, Ashhera, who was famed between the two seas and well-beloved. A wailing arose in Heorot. The demon had taken life for life. The old king was sorrow-stricken when he knew that his chief warrior was slain. He summoned Beowulf to a council, and the hero went with his followers. Along the floor strode the war-famed hero while the timbers resounded his steps. He asked of the king if he had passed according to his desire an easeful night. Ask not of my welfare, the king cried. Sorrow has again fallen upon the Danes. Ashhera is dead. My right-hand man, my counselor, my teacher, the death demon in his murderer, by her is her son's death avenged. My comrade she hath slain, because thou didst kill Grendel, who for long slaughtered my people. So is the feud continued against us. Then did the king tell Beowulf that oft times he heard that two dread stalkers held the moors by night. One of them had a woman seeming, the other was Grendel. None knew if there was a sire in times past. Their lair was under the cliffs where a stream fell downward, and an underworld flood below a tree-girt mere. Nightly was a wonder beheld there, fire in the flood. No man knew how deep was the mere. The heart, when close pursued, will die rather than enter the waters. An awesome place it is. Thence... Do the waves surge the clouds when the wind stirs up fearsome storms that the air is filled with mist and the heavens weep? Then said the king unto Beowulf, Once more do we look to thee for aid. Thou knowest not yet the demon lair, the perilous retreat where the monster may be found. Seek it if thou art unafraid. Then shall I reward as heretofore with gifts of gold, if thou shalt survive. Beowulf was indeed without fear. He besought the king to sorrow not. Better it is, he said, to avenge a comrade than to grieve without end. So he counseled that they should go forth quickly, and follow the demon's blood trail to her den. Bravely he spoke thus. Not in earth's bosom, in mountain wood, or in the sea depths. Go where she may, shall the kin of Grendel escape me. Be patient in thy grief this day, O king, as I expect of thee. With joy the king leapt up, hearing the words that Beowulf spake. He called for his horse, and followed by his men, went forth with Beowulf and his warriors. They followed the track of the demon over the moor, and came to the stony places and the cliffs and the homes of sea monsters. They reached the gray rock overhung by trees, and below they beheld the mere surging and red with blood. On a cliff top they found Ashhera's head. In the water they beheld serpents and awesome sea dragons. 
on a ledge where sea monsters that go down the ocean pass. When the horn gave out a battle lay, they rushed seaward, and one did Beowulf wound unto death with an arrow said that he swam slowly in the water the war men thrust barbed boar spears at it and dragged it ashore with wonder they gazed at their awesome guest beowulf then girded on his armor and on his head put his battled helmet then gave hrothgar's spokesman unfereth unto him the strong blade which was called harunting of iron was it made and tempered with blood of battle it had been forged with twig venom and never had it failed in battle then beowulf addressed hrothgar and besought him to be guardian of his comrades should he himself survive not and to send unto huliarp the treasure he had received i shall achieve fame with harooting beowulf cried or death shall take me he awaited no answer, and plunged the surging waters received him. Downward he sank a day's space ere he found the bottom. Soon the demon discovered that an alien being came against her, and she clutched Beowulf in her finger claws. But by reason of his strong armor, she could do him no harm. Sea monsters attacked him with sharp tusks, so that he could not use his sword, and they followed as the demon drew him into her lair. Then did Beowulf perceive that he was dragged into a hall beyond the sea's reach. The glow of firelight light was shining bright, and Beowulf perceived that the mere wife had taken him. He smote her with his sword, a great free blow he gave, and the blade rang on her head, but no wound could he inflict. Never before had the sword failed in conflict. Then did the hero fling down the blade. He would have his strength of arm for sure defense. So desperate-minded does a battle-man fight when he hopes for fame and reeks not of life. The shoulder of Grendel's mother he seized, and in great fury wrestled and flung the demon down. But fiercely she clutched at him. In, in her claws she held him securely. They struggled together thus until the battle hero, heart-weary at length, was overthrown. On the ground he fell, and the she-demon sat upon him. She drew swiftly her broad and blood-stained dagger to avenge her only son. Then would the hero have died there, but over his shoulder lay his chain armor, and that saved him. To his feet he leapt again. Beowulf suddenly beheld among the armor and the demon's lair an ancient giant sword. It was a blade without an equal. No other living man could wield it, for it was the choice of splendid weapons, and giants had made it. The hero seized it and welded it. Strong was Beowulf, and in battle fury he swung the giant sword and smote the demon a fierce blow, cleaving her at the neck and shattering her bone rings. Right through her body went the blade, and she sank in death. Blood wet indeed was the sword and Beowulf gloried in his deed. Then light flashed through the hall, as when heaven's candle gleams from on high. The hero gazed about him. He saw Grendel lying maimed and dead on his resting place. And in vengeance for the evil that that monster had done, Beowulf smote his body so that it was split open. Then the head he struck off. On the cliff top, the warriors waited, watching the angry waters. In time, Hrothgar beheld the waves rising red with blood. Old and gray-haired war men spoke one to another about the brave one. Nor did they expect to see him return again in triumph, for they deemed that the wolf demon had torn him asunder. So they spoke and waited until in the ninth hour the Shulding heroes turned away. 
Hrothgar went with them to his home. Nor did the Gayats expect ever to behold Beowulf again. Yet they waited, gazing at the blood-red waters. Meanwhile, in the demon's wave-protected hall, the giant sword which the hero had wielded began to waste away in the bloodstream. A strange thing was that, like ice it melted, as when the father unties the frost chains and the flood flows free. Beowulf took not any of the other arms that were on the wall, but he kept the gold and graven sword hilt of which the blade was burnt up by reason of the fiend's hot and poisonous blood. Then, seizing the monstrous head of Grendel, he entered the waters, and soon again he was swimming, he who survived fearsome strife, for by this time were the waters purged of blood, and he rose quickly. He came to shore, and his men rejoiced, as did also the brave hero, for he was proud of his mighty load of sea spoil. Quickly did his men unloose his armor, and with glad hearts they were inlaid with him. Heavy was the burden of Grendel's head, which was carried to the hall on a spear shaft, the warriors marching in triumph. In the feasting chamber they strode, where people sat drinking and dragged Grendel's head along the floor. An awesome sight was that to the nobles and the queen who sat with them. In silence, the warriors gazed upon the monstrous head, wondering greatly. Then did Beowulf address the king, telling him of the dread peril he endured, yea, telling him of the dread peril he endured, ere yet he slew the demon. But now, the hero said, thou canst sleep in Herorot among thy warriors as heretofore, nor fear murderous attacks in the darkness. To Hrothgar gave Beowulf the sword hilt rich in victory, the work of a wondersmith. It was a heritage of the past, and upon it was engraved that primeval war when the surging sea engulfed the race of giants. Terrible were they punished, that people who were alien to the eternal Lord, the supreme ruler, gave them their final deserts in the flood. A gold plate upon the hilt had engraved in runes the name of him for whom the choicest of weapons was first made with decorated hilt and silence in the hall when Hrothgar, son of Helfden, spoke of Beowulf's deeds. Well may he say, an aged guardian who promotes truth and right among the people and remembers all from the far past, that this noble is of high birth. Beowulf, my friend, thy renown is raised above all people, far and wide. With modesty and prudence thou dost bear thyself. My friendship thou shalt have as I promised thee. Thou shalt ever be strength to thy people and an aid to war men. Not so was Heramod to the children of Edwella, the renowned Schuldings. Not for their happiness did he flourish, but to bring cruelty and slaughter to the Danes. God had given him power and strength, greater than any other man, but he had a fierce heart. He gave not money rings. He was without joy, and he endured grief because of his savagery and never-ending enmity with his people. Follow not that example. Have manly virtue. Many winters have made me wise, and for thee I have told this tale. Further did the king give wise counsel to Beowulf, advising him to distribute gifts to his people, so that he might ever have their support, and to avoid vaunting pride, because the day would come when his strength would depart, and in the end death would take him. A great feast was held in the hall, and there was much rejoicing, and Beowulf slept there until the raven, with blithe heart, proclaimed the joy of dawn. Then did the hero bid Hrothgar farewell. An alliance of peace was formed between the Schuldings and the Geats. The old king kissed the hero and shed tears.
To the coast guardian Beowulf gifted a gold-hilted sword. Then, with his followers, he went aboard the ship in which were the treasures and armor and horses which Hrothgar had given. The good ship clove the sea waters. The sail swallowed the wind. The timbers creaked, necked with white foam. The ocean traverser, with curved stem, sailed away. Favorable were the winds, till they saw the Gaiatish headlands, and the keel grafted on the shore. To King Huliar did Beowulf relate his adventures, and then he distributed the gifts he had received, giving that monarch a coat of mail and four horses, and to the queen Huda the beauteous collar and three horses. Huliar awarded the hero a gold-headed sword, much money, a country seat, and the rank of a prince. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.